Good morning or good day, depending on where you are. And welcome all to the UNESCO webinar on open science and the decolonization of knowledge. Soliciting thoughts for the UNESCO recommendation on open science and focusing here particularly on the English speaking Caribbean. We must first thank UNESCO for its strong promotion of finding ways through open access to redress sustainably the inequities of access to published scientific literature that primarily affect the poorer countries of the world. We welcome the extension of the concept of open science to include consideration of the broader hegemonies which have marginalized or excluded from serious consideration by the mainstream scientific establishment of the evolved knowledge systems of many indigenous societies. And we laud the, the espousal of a greater involvement of communities in determining the foci of national scientific research agendas. And here we must particularly thank Bud Hall and Rajesh Tandon, the UNESCO co-chairs at the University of Victoria in community-based research and social responsibility in higher education. We thank them and their co-authors, Leslie Chang, Florence Piron, and Lorna Williams for their thoughtful paper on open science beyond open access for and with communities, a step towards the decolonization of knowledge. This I expect will provide a firm basis for our discussions today, which will certainly include the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks and welcome also to Dr. Liette Vassiot, President of the Canadian National Commission for UNESCO and the UNESCO Chair at Brock University for being here to offer introductory comments on the UNESCO Open Science Declaration. Thanks are also due to Suriani University of Victoria for steering us through some of the organizational details. To the UNESCO National Commission for hosting this, the webinar and also to Everton Hannan, Secretary General of the UNESCO Jamaica National Commission for organizing the Caribbean side of the event. We welcome also and thank for agreeing to share their perspectives, Dr. Brian Coburn, Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. And Dr. Colin Depardeen, Dean of the corresponding faculty at the Cavill campus in Barbados. I must say that it is quite ironical that interest in open science has surged at the same time as developing countries are moving to become knowledge-based based economies and are seeking to protect their intellectual property and ring fence their local knowledge and innovations as a means of generating gravely needed income through patenting and conversion to competitive marketable products. This at least to some degree conflicts with the philosophy of openness and begs for a happy resolution. I note that there are initiatives such as the Canada-based OCAP, Ownership, Control, Access and Possession, which address some of these issues. A major problem I suggest is that the well-established inherently colonial structure of our economic and trading systems will continue to be a stumbling block. Knowledge, or at least information, is, I propose, a raw material and not a finished product. So without the most careful management, the unsustainable but ingrained paradigm whereby colonies provide raw materials at vanishingly low costs and purchase finished products at enormous markups will inevitably supervene, enriching the metropole and impoverishing the colonies. Lack of infrastructure and investment capital will still hamper the realization of significant returns and foster vulnerability to well-resourced competitors. This is clearly oversimplified. I suggest that the problem may not be primarily in the commoditization of knowledge, but in the way in which our economic systems trade in commodities. Enlightened partnerships and collaborations across the North-South divide will undoubtedly be essential to resolution. Finally, in closing, I will share with you the fact that in reviewing our recently revamped Jamaican science policy, 
I could not help but note its wholehearted embrace of science as a commodity and the pursuit of patenting and innovation in the cause of generating income. This, I suggest, should be interrogated, but may not be entirely unsupportable. It's certainly not confined to Jamaica. I was also struck by the nearly complete absence of any tangible policies aimed at involving our communities more integrally in formulating scientific approaches to their local problems. The scientific literacy and engagement of the population as a whole. I hope that this will change. And I believe that discussions of this sort will help to move us toward a new, sustainable, and broadly enriching engagement of science in our global, global village. Welcome again to all, and my best wishes for a productive forum. We will now hear from Dr. Liet Vassior, after which we will have responses from Dr. Brian Coburn, and then from Dr. Colin Depardine. We will then invite comments from a few participants. Please welcome Dr. Thank you very much. And I will share my screen. Dr. Vassior, I can see you. Good. <laughs> Good, and can you see my screen? Yes, I can. So thank you again for uh, this introduction, and it's very uh, appropriate, in fact, uh, what you said. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a UNESCO Chair on Community Sustainability from Local to Global at Brock University, as well as the uh, President of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. I would like uh, first to uh, provide some acknowledgement, first to the land of the indigenous people where we are privileged to live and work. In my case, I live in St. Catharines and I am on the territory of the Otsini and Anishinaabe uh, traditional territory, which is covered by the Upper Canada treaties. I would like to also acknowledge the uh, Canadian Commission for UNESCO for providing a lot of support for this uh, uh, project. And I, 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 this is highly appreciated. I would like also to acknowledge all the universities and organizations that have been uh, working on this, uh, as well as all the people uh, who are sharing knowledge for a better world. And this is including all the people who are on this uh, webinar today. And uh, we have to also uh, acknowledge uh, the authors of this brief on decolonizing knowledge. Uh, it's a great collaboration. And I should say that uh, this is something that I was really concerned and I'm glad that uh, we have these kind of documents that can help enhance the discussion and making sure that it's as inclusive as possible. Now, what are we talking when we talk about open? Open to what? Open science, open access. Uh, I just want to give first a little history. Um, I, in um, 2017, uh, the UNESCO, uh, all the countries, unanimously approved the, the 2017 recommendation on science, on the definition of science and scientific researchers. And this document is very important to understand where we're coming. And in, in this document, it's very clearly written that science, all the type of research that we're doing, should be for the well being of humanity. And it should be available to all. But available to all means what? But it means that it's possible for any researcher across the world to have access to appropriate infrastructure appropriate publication to be able to enhance uh, the, uh, the research and ensure that we are going further. But it also mentioned very well that it should be available to all. All means also communities and social movements that really need to have the read real data not fact, fake news and other things like that. The problem, however, is that we're still excluding some knowledges when we talk about uh, the definition of science and um, researchers, because researchers are not only 
uh, in academia or in government or industry, but they are also in the communities, especially when we think about uh, indigenous communities. The COVID-19 pandemic right now is also underlying even more the importance of open science. Uh, it's challenging really the uh, conventional research that is uh, in closed door in a lab and nobody knows what's happening and its publication are only in very prestigious journals that are not accessible for most people, uh, even some time for even for ourselves as researchers. So that has brought a big debate on these critical issues, the need to have transparency, the need to have access to the right material. Uh, it has a big impact on public welfare. And this is something that is very important, especially when we are in the, in the, in the moment of crisis like that. What is interesting also is that emerged uh, hybrid knowledge structures and these structures are a little bit different than what we used to in terms of enhancing collaboration and trying to move faster and faster in terms of uh, research and knowledge. However, unfortunately, uh, we recognize that it still ex exclude knowledge, some very specific knowledges, especially in the indigenous knowledge that is here in Canada or in Africa or anywhere else in the world often their voice are not heard. And in, in addition, in many cases, they may have some solution that we even don't know, but we discard them because they are not from the normal Western mentality or the neoliberal system. So we have to be very careful about that. So what we see, in fact, when we look at open science is that we have this intersection of dimension of openness openness to text and data. So more the ecologies, if you want, of knowledge. We have openness to society, and this is part of this definition of science, the place-based uh, knowledge. And finally, we have the openness uh, that we have to push for ex to excluded knowledge system. So there is a, a need to look at knowledge equity as well. So this really balance of these dimensions that the uh, recommendation will have to make to make sure that it's all there. If not, we're missing pieces. So the brief talked about uh, several actions for open science, and this, these are important uh, to to get through uh, in the recommendation that will be pushed forward uh, gradually at UNESCO. The first is to support co-construction of knowledge with the community. Uh, in my own case, I work with communities and, and always say that it's important to work not only for the community, but also with the community and by the communities, because the, it's important to have this integration. I always say that if I don't live in that community, I'm not the one that will have the consequences of the decisions. They are, and then they have to be able to have their own right for decision with the right data, with the right research. That's the important part. The other thing that we need to think is really funding uh, indigenous and global South knowledge sharing. This is still missing today. We have to diversify publication board membership, and this is something that I should say has uh, editor in chief of Botany a journal from the Canadian Science Publishing. Uh, this is something that we are really, really conscious uh, now. We have a, a, an equity, diversity and inclusion policy. And my role right now is to try to find new associate editors who are not only men white from Western countries, but they are coming from the South. They are from different races. They are from different genders. And this is very important. Diversity brings a lot more openness and transparency process of information of papers as well. We have to decolonize research and teaching in higher education. Uh, we have to start really moving ahead and, and bring, uh, especially for Canada, we're talking about reconciliation with Indigenous people. 
and but we have to also think about the other uh, races and and, uh, and uh, religions that often uh, are also marginalized and that need also to be included in all these discussion. And finally, we need to share knowledge using creative approaches. And this is uh, something I was talking to Bud yesterday uh, that I told him that uh, the only little weakness that I have with uh, the uh, debrief is uh, the following. Is to recognize the barriers for people. As researchers, we use scientific jargon. We use a scientific jargon that most people don't understand. If you talk to anybody, a resident in the street that doesn't have uh, a university degree, most of the work that we're doing, it's almost incomprehensible for them. So we need to find accessibility. And this means knowledge translation. And uh, this is a f something that I take personally at heart. Uh, with one of my projects with the community of Lincoln, we write weekly blogs, very short blogs, to explain the terminology, to explain what we're doing. And it's amazing how many residents since have been connecting with us because we're publishing that in the local newspaper. And that helps really to bring to another level their understanding. So the open science recommendation timeline uh, is uh, as follow. It's a very tight one. Uh, they have now the uh, first draft of the recommendation that is available and uh, I believe everybody has received the link for it. Uh, so the right now there are these open science webinar series. Uh, the F will be discussed uh, at, at the UNESCO Executive Committee in March 2021 and at the next general conference of UNESCO in November 2021. There is a hope for the adoption of the recommendation. So that means that we have uh, to really involve everyone uh, as much as possible right now to put comments during the consultation process. So what can you do uh, and what can we do, all of us in fact? First, share this brief and the recommendation, the draft recommendation. Ask your UNESCO National Commissions uh, to support these consideration that we have in this brief, but you can go further. There are probably other things that we have not all thought about that other people would have probably good ideas. Um, and we have to continue to organize these kind of discussions with the universities, with the communities. Uh, and you have the link here for the consultation. So just make sure that uh, you can connect with as many of your colleagues or friends that uh, can bring uh, more and more information and support to work further on this recommendation. So I thank you. Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Shiniguach. And just to finish, I'm leaving you with uh, a little uh, thing about uh, that is for me a big reflection. I am, I am a woman. I am a woman of a generation. I am a woman from a generation of poverty. I am a woman from a poverty class heritage. I am a woman. And it's representing even myself in some way. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, I think that that um, places are us on a good footing to go on with our discussions, and um, and so uh, I will just go on. I think we can just leave questions until afterwards. I will just go on and ask Dr. Brian Coburn to give his response. Thank you, Chair, and good day to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, inv the invitation to take part in this exercise. And thanks also to Chan and Hall et al for that very interesting and thought provoking paper um, that's forming the basis of some of these discussions here today. Um, I want to say though that because of the breadth of discussion here, that um, perhaps we needed to invite some local historians and social scientists um, to help frame some of the issues because uh, some of them are outside the, the realm of pure science. 
Um, much, in fact. Um, right. Now, we are talking mainly here about decolonization of science, but um, the, the pandemic is raising a very real possibility as well of recolonization. Um, with the move to online classes, for example, there are risks and opportunities. We've already been approached, for example, by at least one North American um, tertiary institution, um, asking us to serve as an outpost to run practical exercises while uh, residents here in the Caribbean uh, register enroll in programs in that institution. So recolonization uh, or an entrenchment of colonization is also a danger that's um, accelerating because of the pandemic situations. OK, moving now to the. Um, the whole idea of decolonization, it looks like there are there. Are, I would phrase it as two main pillars. Um, one being the establishment of partnerships. So this for me is, is, is really clear if we want to decolonize science. Um, partnerships, partnerships with um, North South partnerships, but also in country partnerships that uh, really need a robust and practical framework uh, in, in order to permit us, that's the scientists and everyone else to walk in each other's worlds. This is an absolute requirement. And for this partnership for decolonization of science to really take root, these partnerships need to be established so that they can they can grow organically and um, serve as a conduit for two way communication. And I'm talking, of course, partnerships with the public and private sector, uh, schools, communities. And now, and just to be clear, it's happening in in different ways, in small ways. But what's needed is a concerted mechanism to bring all these bits and pieces together. I'm, I'm talking, here, for example, about internships uh, for college students. These are very useful for bridging the world of work with academia. But it happens on uh, pretty much an ad hoc uh, manner. But if we're interested in, in bringing more science to bear on what's happening um, in communities, bring feedback from communities to academia, the relationships perhaps need a more solid framework, a more extensive framework so that it happens in a structured manner. The other thing I have to say coming out of the, um, the recommendations as well, um, the attention to funding and Dr. Vasir mentioned in fact, um, well, she, she spoke about uh, publication board membership and this is absolutely vital publication board membership. The the challenge also if we're talking about uh, membership of funding agencies is to find um, individuals who would be able again to walk in more than one world. It's the it would probably be really destructive if or counterproductive if you had participants who were seen as being token members of either an editorial board or um, a funding agency. And there again um, lies a particular challenge in identifying individuals who can straddle both worlds and maintain respect for both worlds. Um, entirely possible, but uh, quite a challenge. Right, um, access to data and the ability to um, contribute to that data. Uh, 
we there, there was some talk in the in the Chan and Hall et al document about um, publishing and the extent to which uh, open source has 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 um, made publi publishing for some communities a bit easier. But we again run the risk of um, developing uh, new cliques wherein um, individuals who may have been traditionally shut out from publishing in certain uh, journals on certain subjects may create their own cliques in the in the um, in this new dispensation and uh, actually not solve the problem. OK, there are maybe just one or two more items that I wanted to mention. From the Chan Hall et al document, consideration number two really caught my eye. Uh, it concerned uh, initiatives that can build communication capacities or university libraries that decide to become publishers. Um, what a lovely notion. I, I haven't actually heard this idea articulated before and there are probably some financial reasons why it hasn't taken off in some jurisdictions. Uh, I know that locally there has been a lot of discussion about having the university libraries serve as repositories of uh, local research and knowledge. Uh, and, and in particular ownership of that knowledge, but the idea of serving as publishing houses um, I haven't heard that articulated before, so I really like that. OK, um, um, and one more thing. Higher education institutions this is consideration 13. Higher education institutions and government should abolish university rankings and evaluation based on criteria is by powerful institutions in the global north. This is just saying we've been doing a lot of work on assessment instruments for promotion of academic staff. And the idea of impact factors is proving uh, really difficult to hurdle. And one of the suggested mechanisms was to look at the impact of uh, the work of colleagues as opposed to the impact factors. And as with anything, the impact factor, um, which is uh, getting a lot back in different quarters, nevertheless continues to be really difficult to dislodge. Um, but the idea of um, measuring impact is perhaps um, why it's so difficult to bring in different metrics to replace what is already there and really democratize the whole process more. Um, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave in time, I guess, for, for questions. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop at that point and, and, and we can we can re-engage as, as necessary. Ron? Sorry, my mic was muted. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Coburn. Um, some very interesting points. And um, in so far as you have left some time for questions, um, does anyone have any questions that they wish to pose at this at this point? If there if there is none, then um, we can put those on hold and 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 work it in the general comment and question um, section and just go on to hear from Dr. Depredine. Are there are there any Go ahead. Are there any issues that anyone would like to raise? Um, and if not, then Colin, can you go ahead? Um, Dr. Depp. 
Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll attempt to share my. It's just a few slides I want to share. I'll see if I can share. Okay. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see that. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, what I decided to do is very quickly and very briefly um, go through some of the experiences I've had trying to implement a few of the open science principles. Not, nothing as extensive as what was given the brief. I think the brief, I should say, was very well written and very extensive, extensive and something that we as a side of the world need to embrace. Um, so this slide here essentially shows some of the comments I've gotten over the years from persons, various people in Barbados when I became dean. This includes staff, inventors, teachers, you name it, um, those in the public sector with regards to the, to the state of science in, in Barbados and perhaps the Eastern Caribbean. Nothing here is new, but one of the things that they obviously talk about is the lack of funding and one of the points they do point out was when you get the funding, for example, you are always, your hands are always tied in such that you always have to bring in consultants from outside of the region and very little comes to the region and therefore the experience never stays. The, the other point that they, come, they say is that science in generally in the region is treated as an add-on. Um, until recently, Barbados did not have a Ministry of Science science was always tapped on to the end of some other ministry and pretty much ignored. Um, many of the solutions to resolve that were based on, I suppose the word is um, colonialized um, models and models that simply don't work for the region and we have tried them and, and, and they have never worked. But I think the, the most, um, oh and I should also say and because of these different issues the enrollment in our faculty was declining rather, rather but one of the things I think stood out most is the definition of a scientist and, and what we portray or understood to be. And I think um, the best example I could give of that is that when I had an outreach session in a primary school with my um, deputy outreach, uh, a young black female, the, one of the students said to me, he didn't realize we had black women in our faculty who were science, scientists. And I think, and when you spoke to them, their whole view of science is what is dictated by the media and by the television programs of being male from certain countries and restricted to certain places and certain types of schools and so on. So essentially as Dean, what, I, what we decided to do as a faculty is to adopt a different philosophy uh, from what I was told I became Dean. When I say told, um, retired scientists and whatnot, we decided to adopt a science for all um, philosophy, which on many aspects had, it, um, matches what is in the open science. And essentially what we want to do here is get across to the public of Barbados, the private and public sectors, that science is not restricted to our faculty. There is a belief, uh, it is interesting, there is a belief that our understanding that the University of the West Indies is founded with the, with the, the idea that anyone could come to the university there's no discrimination, there, there's no bias. Whichever background you come, come from, you could come to the University of the West Indies and our purpose is, is to support the region. But for some reason, people didn't see that from my faculty. And that was based on that image where um, you, you look a certain way, you come from a certain the rest of us are not included. So we wanted to change that image, but we also wanted to get across to the public that you can participate in science at different levels. You don't necessarily have to be a researcher like those in the faculty, but you definitely can can dabble as an inventor, a maker, or a teacher, or whatever aspect you want to be in. And you, we, the faculty, will support you. The other thing that we decided is that we needed to have accessibility for all. And one of the notions we wanted to dispel were and many, but the two primary notions we wanted to dispel is that there are only men in the faculty, which is not true. And the other one is that if you're disabled, you can't become part of the faculty, which obviously is not a nonsense, but it was a belief that is permeating the uh, population. And we, we also wanted to do things like increase sharing and collaboration with the government, the private sector, as well as the public and so on. That latter thing at the bottom of the slide, Embrace Your Inner Nerd, was our marketing campaign, so to speak, where we were telling persons to embrace the science within themselves 
and, and work with the faculty to make science more open and more transparent and so on. Now here are some of the benefits that came out of that uh, exercise and it's an ongoing exercise. It's over years, things don't change overnight. As a result of that, we had a growing awareness of science and a growing awareness of, of the true image of what the scientist is. And I, and I have to say, I think the open science uh, concept pushes us back to the, what I believe is, the, and it says in the document, the original belief of science, which is for the benefit of all and all can participate. So we've seen since then a dramatic increase in our student enrollment. And now we have reached the point where we have the largest enrollment we've ever had in the history of the faculty, according to the numbers that I have, subject to correction. But if it's not the highest, it's the second highest. But one of the things that we are very proud of is that we created something called the Science and Technology Festival, which some people might call a science fair. But what I, what I like, and it started two years ago, we had it um, this year as well, just before the lockdown as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we clearly may not have it next year, but the point is what the reason we created that was to introduce the public that science is not just in our faculty, but it occurs in business. Uh, it occurs in the military, it occurs, occurs in the banks. Science and technology is used by all, and we want to get that message across. And it was a great success. And the reason I say that is that we had, in the first instance, 1,600 plus students, plus the public, come to the first instance of, of this, the first time we had. And we had students from the nursery to the tertiary level. We had all races, all religions, students with and without disabilities, you name it, everybody turned up by the bus loads. And what I, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is that this to me indicates there is a desire and a, and, a, and a willingness within the Caribbean population to be participants in science. And I think that the open science concept will, will in my opinion, drive that, drive, drive that uh, desire to be involved. And we also had, um, since then, increasing the uh, requests for access to publications, data. Um, a number of our students have started, decided to start their own businesses based on the, on their, their, the knowledge, sorry, gained from their various courses in the, in the faculty. Um, this is the last slide here, but these are generally some of the steps that people have been asking, not just the faculty, asking, but the general population and those who came to the festival want to see, now that they've had a taste, now that they have a belief in, in the possibilities. Um, these steps don't have to occur necessarily in this order. This is just an example of what people are asking, but obviously it's much, much wider here. Um, more transparency in, in the data collected and access to it, and they want the barriers removed. And that, that's not necessarily as easy as it sounds because I think um, one of our biggest problems in, in this side of the world is we don't actually have the software tools uh, available and the database systems available to make it possible. And, and I think the open science uh, concept speaks to that, not thinks it does speak to that, and I think we should uh, follow through on that. But they do say so. Uh, the other thing they point out is that when we have research projects involving the community, and we take, we do our surveys and collect the data, the data then disappears within our repositories and they never see it. So more and more they're saying, well, if you're coming into our community to, to do whatever research, we expect to have access to that data. And we, have, we expect to be participants in the analysis of the data after you've done whatever you want to do with it. Um, the other thing is that they, they're asking their leaders to listen to them, the faculty, to trust in us. In other words, stop always automatically assuming that whenever you have a problem in science and technology resolved, that you can't come to the faculty or you can't come to the, to, to the population and automatically go somewhere outside of the region. And I think that stems from the, the, the image that I was talking about at the start, where we believe that true scientists don't um, evolve out of um, developing countries. And, of, and another um, point that they point out is that we have a tendency in Barbados to create no end of science policies, but we never implement them. And they're, they're asking, you know, can you please create one and stick to the plan? And I tend to support that. And I will also go one step further and, and, and say that we should really send the open science policy 
to the leaders of the region and say, look, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It is here written down, and this can help you move your science, um, your STEM policies and wishes forward. Okay. I know that's very brief, but I will just end by saying that um, my experience in, in all of this has been one where there is a desire for, by the population and the faculty to work together, public included as well. There is a desire to, to see that knowledge shared. And if you do that, if you do that, you will create the um, innovation and entrepreneurship and all the other things that the region desires from science and technology. So I will end at this point. Thank you very much, Dr. Deperdeen. Um, that was very interesting. And um, I am particularly encouraged by the results that you are um, in terms of enrollment and so on, as, as a result of your um, inclusive community science type of uh, types of activities. Um, that community involvement is something that I think we really do need to accelerate and, 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 and promote in, in the region. And um, it is good to see that there, there seems, at least in Barbados, to be a receptive audience. I think a very good paradigm that I've certainly seen in Jamaica is the involvement of the university in the Augustown community and, and the, um, the Augustown Film Festival that has come out of the of the engagement of the university with the community in terms of the, um, the Caribbean uh, mass communication um, uh, department and, and, and the, the teaching and activities there. This has been tremendously successful, um, but I, I certainly don't see here an equivalent in the area of science. And, um, and I would certainly love to see developments on that. Um, any, any, any further comments on this? Yeah, Ron, so let me just jump back in there. Um, yes. So I was, I was very happy to hear Colin there, um, and it seems to be part of the Caribbean zeitgeist at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. the, the idea of um, uh, democratizing science as it were. Um, for example, the, the math department at, at um, the Faculty of Science and Technology in Trinidad, they partnered with some secondary schools to host a math fair of all things. You would imagine that, um, well, other people thought, well, a math fair, that's quite a leap. Who is going to attend such a thing? Um, um, the answer surprised us, a lot of young people who seem to really enjoy the exercise to the extent that it has twice outgrown the larger venues that we provided for it. Um, the whole question, there's, there's something called a bio blitz uh, uh, showing uh, citizen science. They recently were able to identify a new species of snake. Um, we held a science week last year, a full five days under the theme science and communities. So it's it, it appears to be part of the zeitgeist that um, this this idea of bringing science to the people and bringing the people to science and um, really having an appreciation as um, Colin had indicated, the question of who is a scientist and what is science. Um, those questions uh, seem to be um, in the air right now. Um, on the on the subject also of uh, uh, democratization of science, science is both uh, democratic and very non-democratic. Um, it, it, it listens to all manner of voices and yet it's deaf to some voices. Uh, lots of challenges here with respect to um, how you ensure that uh, people are heard without giving a platform to bogus science, um, as as we see, as we're struggling with right now, all around the planet. Um, okay, those were some of my um, um, thoughts after hearing Colin. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, 
for those comments, Brian. I, 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 I think you raise a very interesting point in terms of the issue of the distinction between valid and non-valid data and, uh, and inputs into the scientific discourse. Um, of course, one of the things that is offered by your, your mainstream journals is the peer review process and the, the, um, the, the ratings of journals will often be related to the reliance that you can give that the, the things that do appear are um, valid and, um, and reliable uh, pieces of work. It's not always the case, mind you, but, but certainly um, it is one of the things that you, you look to when you go to the, to the more established, higher impact journals. Um, as, we, as we seek to find new ways of publishing material, and vetting material to remove some of the exclusionary barriers, um, we certainly are going to be faced with some of those issues of, of ensuring that um, non-verifiable information may get lodged and could introduce the, and could raise the noise level of the discourse. Um, this is this is a distinct danger that that needs to be, I think, guarded against. And I would love to hear some comments um, along along this line as to how uh, what the dangers are likely to be that we will face as we open up our science. I mean, we have, we have, we have, we have seen on the uh, um, open discourse media um, the the rise of of so-called fake news and 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 um, and the tendency to 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 have conspiracy theories spread and all this kind of, of business. Um, how do we uh, move away from the hegemony of the of the established journals, but at the same time um, help to protect the readership um, ultimately um, from the the noise level being raised? by the introduction of, of unverifiable and on, um, you know, um, and, and, and improperly uh, arrived at conclusions. Can, can we open up the discussion on that? Hello, anybody there? This is Liet here. Um, yes. I can probably uh, start the discussion, and and I think you're right that uh, you know opening the data. What does it mean, especially for um, probably some groups that would like to exploit? And this is where it's so important to to uh, to have very very clear standards on how we 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 communicate the data, especially when we talk with uh, the general public because this is where it can uh, become a danger. Uh, it's, it's a question also that um, unfortunately, most media now do not have specialists in science, don't have, and I, just because we did some work here in the region with the media, uh, most of them now do not have the, uh, even the capacity to, uh, to write their own, their own papers, their own uh, articles. So they will rely on others, and this is where the danger can come. It all depends on their interpretation of the data. So this is why I think at one point it's a question also of putting principle or standards on uh, how we, we communicate with the public, but also how to make sure that on the media side or on the social media side as well, um, there is uh, some standards for them as well. Because this is where you're right. Uh, the uh, the fake news is a danger, uh, and I've seen that uh, in some uh, some places, where uh, especially during the pandemic, 
Uh, people are taking seriously certain things that are that, that are wrong, in fact. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so I, so I, th th thanks for that, um, Liat. And, um, and one of the, one of the uh, ideas that I saw floated was the moving away from impact factors. Uh, one of the things that that um, was suggested was was um, looking as an alternative. I think um, Colin suggested an alternative way of of coming at that, uh, but no, I thought it was um, Brian, in fact, who suggested that uh, impact of the work rather than the impact of the journal is the thing that should be should be assessed. But the question, of, as you recognize, is, is how um, how do you then go about assessing that? Because because that's not a trivial matter to to, to address. But but one of the things that I saw floated was the idea of using um, some kind of uh, quality measure, which I think is the same thing. And, and I'm not entirely sure how that would work. Uh, as it mentioned in the in the um, the, the Chan Hall paper. Um, and if there's anybody who might wish to comment on that. I so this is Angela Aline here, a faculty member yes. um, at the Keeble campus in Barbados and the oh, Colin Deputy Dean, Angela Aline. Hello, Angela. Hi. And Hello. so I found the discussion so far very robust and very interesting and I am I'm proud to, to be part of this uh, discussion and, and hear the, the views of our deans, both um, Colin and, and Brian. I just wanted to, to comment on on two things. Your last comment about the fact that, I think it was Lizette who mentioned the fact that many media houses are unable to, to even write science articles properly within the region. And I, and I believe fundamentally we need to open up our science students at the tertiary level to other um, forms of communicating their science. In other words, we need to ensure that when our students are uh, within our faculties, that they understand that just studying the science and writing a scientific article is not enough. There are other ways in which we can uh, produce knowledge products. And I think engaging students in these other ways to communicate science, um, maybe through cross-disciplinary studies and so forth, or even specifically associated with science writing, etc., will add to this um, current discourse and um, as Brian said, the current zeitgeist about science and community. Mm -hmm. For me, for example, listening to the, the, um, the whole COVID discourse, it's quite interesting to hear the ordinary man in the street talk about the PCR test and know mm -hmm. what that means. Talk mm -hmm. about the antibody test and be able to distinguish the difference. And so for me, that tells us that there is um, there, 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 there is a yearning or an ability by the ordinary Caribbean citizen to understand the science when it's communicated uh, properly and when it means something to, to them. So that's uh, basically my two comment, well, my main comment on what I've heard so far. Thank you again for listening. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, that that was um, actually very, very um, the business of writing, of course, is a is a major thing. And as an editor for our local science journal, I I can tell you that we we get many many articles in that essentially you virtually have to rewrite. And my um my coworkers tell me that I I am I'm very bad because I'm helping these people to, to rewrite their articles and then they will take them, go away, refashion them and submit them to a high impact journal. <laughs> and, and then we won't get any articles. Um, one of the, the, the problems that we face in this part of the world, um, when you try to promote local journals, which is one of the, um, the, the, the things that, that we're trying to, to do in the, in, the, in the proposals here. Um, the proposal to to encourage 
the development of local journals that that can be more inclusive of local concerns and, and, and considerations. But but the but the the business of, of actually writing proper um, properly clear and um, and communicative uh, um, scientific uh, documents at, at, at different levels um, uh, becomes very important and how we how we set about trying to to get our populace to 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 embrace this and to and to and to learn how to to become more involved um, in 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 clear um, writing and making observations and so on. Um, I think this is important. The, the, the way we try to train our, our populace to, to make, to be, to be careful in recording these things and to make the observations in a way that can lead to verifiable conclusions. Is there somebody with a hand up? I see Marcia Query. Hi, Prof. How are you? Marcia, how do you do? Good. I am good. I am very good. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion because one of my, I wouldn't say pet peeves, but one of the things that I recognize is that our science writing, um, we don't really put much emphasis on science writing and um, helping each other and helping the students to write for journals and sometimes you kind of suffer from this imposter syndrome where you feel well your work is not good or your writing is not good enough and especially when you submit it to a journal and they reject it you feel okay you know why maybe what we are doing we're a third world country we're developing our our research is not good enough and and i think that makes people a little reluctant to just keep going at the writing and the submitting to journals. And also we have suffered over decades from this, I think you're calling it colonialization of research where the people come from abroad, they do the research, they take the data back, you help them with the research, you give them the information, you, you know, journals they publish in, maybe you are a co-author, maybe you are acknowledged, but we don't always see ourselves as the primary investigator, the primary researcher, and the person who is, you know, pushing the research and, and, and the publication. So I think maybe it's a confidence thing, maybe it's a, and I speak somewhat personally, maybe it's this imposter syndrome thing, but I think it's something that's worth looking at, as you say, particularly with the COVID um, situation here where many researchers are unable to come to their, you know, outposts to do their research and yet they have not set up the system in those places for the research to continue. So they're going to have data gaps because they didn't really think it necessary to train somebody on the ground to continue doing what they have been doing. So. These are some of my thoughts on the the subject matter. Okay, thank you very much, Marcy. I think in that last comment that you made, you were, you were referring to the inability of collaborators who are coming from outside of the country to to come and do the research that they were doing in collaboration with local persons. Right. Yes, uh, because of the COVID um, issues. And, and not having anyone trained to, to continue. Um, you know, uh, that, of course, is an important part of the whole business that, that, that whenever we have collaborations, we do have to try to ensure that there is a, a very strong element of capacity building that is, that is engaged there and not just a, a question of you know, someone coming in, getting involved, doing something uh, and, and gaining the benefits and gaining the information and taking off with it and 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 doing their own thing um you know immediately the thing that comes to mind is one of the cases that was cited in the in the paper that we're that we're considering of of a of i think it was there of a nigerian author who found it impossible to get a piece of work published until he included 
a, a, a known male researcher from the Metropole um, as a co-author. And once that happened, the paper suddenly became a paper of quality that was worth being accepted. I, I have often thought that, I, I often ask myself the question, why is it that when we review papers, we do the review blind so that the authors don't know who the reviewer is. It really should be done the other way around as well. The reviewers should not know the authors or the institutions from which they come. Because I can assure you that even in the most prestigious journals and possibly especially in the most prestigious journals, one of the most important factors in determining the acceptability of your, of your, of your article is, is, the, is the institution that you're coming from and the names of the authors who are on the paper. Um, and, and that makes all the difference in the world. It is, it is not merely the consideration of the quality of, of, of the research. Um, and this is unfortunate, but, but, but so it is. And while we're trying to patch and, <clears throat> and re reinvent these processes, this is certainly one of the things that I believe we ought to be taking into consideration. Um, any other comments? I don't see any hands. <coughs> Professor Young, this is Sandra Richards. Yes, Sandra. Hi, my hand is, <coughs> but I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I see you now. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to register my, um, my appreciation of this, discussion it's very very encouraging and necessary um, and I was prompted to raise my hand because of um, Marcia's contribution um, I think that the imposter syndrome is very real I think that uh, many in my experience my own personal experience but also my experience with colleagues, maybe because of where I sit as well, um, the the impact of submitting papers to journals and so forth um, is is very challenging. And as an, an academic, one expects that. But I think with that whole colonial aspect, it has a particular impact on those of us in and from the region because, and you alluded to it in your um, your contribution just now in that if, if you add a particular author recognized as being of the standard, um, all of a sudden you, your work is viewed very differently. And so um, the, the position of primary researcher or, um, you know, the originator of any any research is impacted by how you are viewed depending on where you are from. And so I think it's really important that we do have our local journals and we do have our local publications. Um, but uh, just following up on the piece about people writing properly or being viewed as writing properly, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts vis-a-vis um, -vis the whole conversation about colloquial or so-called colloquial or nation language, you know, we're, we're, we're now legitimizing a different way of speaking, a different way of being, but yet the standard by which you are judged when you submit may not take into account, unless it's a literary piece, um, those dynamics. So the perspective, um, that is outside of the historical perspective uh, kind of relegates your, your contribution to the margins, if you like. So I just w wondered what thoughts were um, around that. And, and before I close, I was very, um, I, I guess I'm very encouraged. I'm very encouraged by the idea of disseminating 
knowledge in, in different, more creative ways. I think, uh, is it Liette Basir was talking about the, the blogs, the short weekly blogs and uh, yeah. so, so forth and being a researcher that is actually going into communities. And I think um, also Professor uh, Coburn talked about uh, having integrity, straddling, but still being seen as being legitimate in both, um, in both worlds. I think this is very encouraging for me, especially for a University of the West Indies that really speaks to the diaspora in a particular way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, I I would um I would like to 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 hear some feedback on this area from from Liet. Um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, um, Dr. Vasier. Yes, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I yeah. think it's uh. I would I would say that uh, this is the important part is that, that um, we have to be careful we talk to communities and it goes back a little bit to when I talked about the media and the standards that we have to probably define at one point is that to be able to have you know to reduce the uh, the issues of uh, uh, deniers uh, the re to reduce the issues of uh, fake news and all these things we need to make sure that we are accessible as people you know sometime unfortunately I know even some of my own colleagues uh, tend to be uh, thinking that they are at a higher level than the rest of the population because they are at the university and that um, they don't feel that they need to talk to the communities. And I think they, they are missing the point. It goes back to uh, what was said a bit earlier by uh, some of our colleagues in terms of the impact of the people instead of the impact factors. I think it's the same thing. It's, it's really uh, the importance of bringing together the um, a way that everybody can understand. And it's only that way that you can start having implementation of solution. And, and it's often the best way also for them to connect and see that, uh, uh, yes, I probably have some other ideas as well. And this is what you want to bring as you know, it's this possibility of the dialogue that can probably be more positive at the end than uh, just trying to, to be too scientific and that nobody can understand us. Well, it seems to me, you know, that, um, that this is something that is recognized uh, right across the board. I, 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 am, I am thinking in, in particular of the, of the, the fact that, the, that the, the magazine, the journal Science, clearly divides itself into two parts. It divides itself into a more popular section that, that, that discusses and, um, and talks about the, the, the scientific articles that are appearing in the journal in a, in a, in a, in a, more, so, in a more social and, and interprets these, these, um, these, these articles in, in the first part. And then the more detailed uh, articles with, with, the, with the, the scientific data and, and, and analyses and all that comes afterwards. And I think that this is a, is a, is a, is a, a very useful um, way of presenting your scientific data. In fact, it's one of the things I try to do with our journal here is, is to encourage um, both proper scientific articles and interpretive articles that, that, that Place the findings in the social context and and um, and interpret the findings you um, know in, in a way that the layman can understand and, and appreciate. Interestingly enough, Ivor, um, I should say nature and science are very in, 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 inaccessible, inaccessible to most people. That's true. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and interestingly enough. Um, when we did our research on knowledge mobilization with the media in this region, one thing that uh, the uh, many journalists were saying is that scientists tend to try to think that they can write for lay people. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, it's not. It has been, and 
should say, uh, for me, the best example is we had for a while uh, an, an insert in newspapers about the one ton challenge to reduce uh, climate, the issue of greenhouse gas emission. And mm -hmm. I asked my husband, who is not in science, he's not a scientist, he's not a researcher, uh, to read it, to see if he understood. He didn't understand most of it. Mm -hmm. And that was for the lay people, but it didn't work. And this is why at one point people don't act because they cannot understand really what is there. Again, it was written by government people who had uh, a high degree of education and probably didn't really connect correctly with uh, communication agents that understand what's happening in the media. So we have to always be careful with that, I think. So, so not only do we, do we need to Try to produce materials that um, that are accessible to 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 the local population and to, to to a more general audience. But we also need to have good communicators who are involved in the process, because um, we might otherwise fail to meet our target altogether. Brian. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. I I couldn't agree more with Leah and earlier on Angela. Um, Popular popularization of science often is really seen as science light, and so scientists tend not to take it particularly seriously, and and perhaps even um, as Leah suggested, overestimate their ability to communicate uh, complex and and even not so complex science issues to laypersons, including and even intellectual laypersons, where particular discipline of science is concerned. Um, I just wanted to add as well, um, this is some of what I was um, referring to earlier when I mentioned the need for robust frameworks to facilitate this, this two-way communication between communities and uh, the science community. Um, mm -hmm. That need to, for it to happen on a, on a organized and regular basis as opposed to happening um, on the odd occasion or um, with, with no real regularity or no meaningful exchange taking place. Um, uh, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, uh, and, uh, something in the in the document, the Chan and Hall doc, et al document um, about the entrepreneurial university. Given the often um, difficult uh, um, task for regional governments to fund uh, research and tertiary education. Uh, it's inevitable that we pivot towards a more entrepreneurial focus. Um, that in turn would seem to quite naturally reduce the emphasis on publication and move more towards uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, I, I, I got the general impression from the document that um, this was seen as not something so desirable um, and, and I was hoping that we could have some more discussion on that aspect because um, certainly from our perspective it appears to be certainly very desirable if we wish to continue um, function. Thanks. Yes, I think that this is a very important question, and um, it is one that I, I, I would think should be addressed. Um, let me just take Colin's question first. Colin? Yes, so, following off from Brian's point, I I have never seen a disconnect between having publications and, and so on versus entrepreneurship. I, I, I have always had the view that one, one leads to the other. The, the danger is, um, in other words, the research leads to, the, the, to someone uh, commercializing the, the aspect. The danger there, I think, is ending up back in the position where we want to go away from, where you commercialize something and then you keep all that information to yourself in order to um, maximize your profits. But so that so it goes back to the, the balance that we need to find. But I've, I've always thought that one would lead to the other. And Brian is correct. In this side of the world, 
we're not going to get, it is impossible for us, given our population size and so on, to generate the sort of monies necessary for pure research. At some point, we're going to have to go up the value chain and commercialize. What we as a population need to be careful of is not ending up in the predicament that um, other countries have found where you have large corporations dominating certain aspects of, of research and dominating the market and then no, no other person can get it and so on. So I just thought it would make that contribution. Professor Young, you're, you're muted if you're, if you're speaking. Yeah, um, thank, thank you very much, Colin, for, for, for that. And um, I was just saying that um, I, I'm very happy that you raised it because it, it is something that I think we need to address head on. Um, the more and more universities are finding themselves, and, and certainly particularly in the developing countries, finding themselves strapped for support from governmental funds. Um, it, is, it is quite clear that the trend has been reducing support from government and increasing um, placing of reliance um, for, for funding um, on the universities as entrepreneurial institutions. Um, so, so there is no doubt that we, that the universities are going to have to address this issue and, and come to grips with it. Um, whether or not uh, this, uh, I, I suppose you could call commoditization of knowledge is, is a good thing or a bad thing, I think very much depends on, on, on how it's done. The patenting process inherently um, tries to address this issue in a kind of way because of the limitation on, on patenting and all of that, so that after you're allowed to, to exploit your, your discovery or your invention for a period of time only, after which the patent expires, and having had to write down the, the process, the process then becomes available um, as, a, as, as a common good as a, as a, um, and, and accessible to all. Uh, whether this is sufficient it clearly is something that one might, might need to, to, to address. And, and in any event, um, the, the, the position that many developing countries find themselves in is that they simply don't have the capital, the resources or the infrastructure to quickly convert inventions, discoveries, innovation, well, innovations and discoveries into, um, into products. And um, the consequence is often that, that these can be um, hijacked and exploited by the well-heeled, um, you know, competitors. So, so it is something that is a concern. And um, again, it is something that we need to bring into a comfortable philosophical space where we feel that we, we um, know where we're going with it and that uh, we're dealing with it in a progressive and sustainable fashion. Any comments on that? Hello? Comment then. Uh, no, I would mention patents. Um, it is interesting because, well, not, well, definitely in the software world, I'm not sure about the other aspect. Um, the system is broken because large corporations just generate large numbers of patent, um, patent submissions. And then what you find now in, in this side of the world is that every time you attempt to do something unique, somebody has already submitted something that they have no real intention of using, but they want to make sure that that particular software aspect or electronic aspect cannot be taken up by us on this side of the world without paying out some money. So I, I think the, the intention was good, but from my experience, it has been um, abused. And, and then the cost of getting the patent is so ridiculously high for us on this side of the world that it's rather pointless. So uh, I just thought um, that's my opinion on it. I think it, it's highly broken and needs some serious repair. But there, there is no doubt that you're right here, Colin, that the, that the process really does need revisiting and revision. 
And um, of course, the, the question really becomes um, revision how and revision to what? And, uh, you know, how, how do we reconcile these, these impulses? Um, is, there, is there anyone who would like to comment on that? Hello. Soliciting responses. Andy. Again, yeah. I would just like to add to the last um, discussion piece of information. Discussion by uh, revision by whom? Because we have to remember who set the whole system up in the first place. And I think mm. as we're talking about open science and um, democratization of science, the whole patent system is not very democratic at all or very open. That's just my, yeah. my contribution. Yeah. But, the, but the question really is, um, how do you build the cat? Uh, that I can't say. I, I yeah. think um, it will require, as Brian was saying earlier on, uh, new frameworks for not just South-South, but South-North partnerships and uh, a recognition, rec recognizing that um, there are fundamental aspects of science that need to be opened up, opened up, basically. Um, I, I don't think that um, Bud Hall or any of those other persons are present. Um, so is Liet still here? And um, can we call upon you as the... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, what I can say is that uh, I, I understand what uh, Angela is trying to say, and um, th it's interesting because I've, I've been doing uh, international work for quite a long time, and for me, I always take um, my colleague from China, Ecuador, or Africa the same way than uh, a colleague from Canada, because I believe that uh, if you have a degree, a degree from one place or another, uh, you know, you have the degree and that's it. Uh, and for me, it's more question at that point to understand however the culture and the tradition of the country as well, uh, because it's not the same everywhere. Um, and I should say, I, in fact, it's, interestingly enough, um, the project in Ecuador, uh, the uh, university and colleagues that I'm working with have uh, developed a model which uh, they are patenting themselves and uh, and supporting them only. I'm, I'm not even a co-author or anything uh, because I think it's it's there. You know, when I said at one point, it's important that it it's the decision are made by the people who will have the consequence. I think this is something that is important and all that. So when we collaborate, um, I'm trying to make sure that uh, there is this relationship that is open, but it has to be established. I think there's a question, unfortunately, uh, and I agree. I, I, at one point, uh, someone mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the universities and our companies in the US trying to uh, get into the university and tell them almost what to do. Uh, this is a very big danger that we, we see in many places. And, uh, and I'm always trying to find a way to, to make sure that uh, we're all equal by the end. Um, and for example, I'm just starting a new project, excuse me, a new project in Africa. Uh, and my first reaction was to uh, ask, are you okay that we use open science um, uh, in terms of uh, system? And at that point, instead of uh, buying their expensive software that uh, needs to be renewed every year, and at one point, you know, during the project, it's great with the money, no problem. But as soon as we finish the project, it doesn't work. Uh, so what uh, we have been doing is making sure that we're using open systems, so open science framework uh, that are giving us the possibility at that point to continue the work even after the project is finished. So it becomes a real collaboration, uh, transparent collaboration. Uh, where everybody is equal. And I think this is what, uh, when, when I look at um, open science and the uh, open infrastructure, 
this is what a big part of it is to make sure that uh you know and, and i just think about like in statistics for example i do a lot of biostatistics and uh, for a long time we were with you know sas or spss or these you know, big companies that are very expensive and and most universities have to buy licenses if they want to to be able to have access now most researchers are moving to r because r is free and we can change the uh the scripts as we want so it becomes a common language for everyone and i think this is uh part of the process that will need to be uh to be done gradually uh is trying to find a process that allows everybody to have a common language uh, uh in terms of science even if we are going to write you know either in english and french and spanish and chinese etc so th this is the thing it will be the balance there's a fine balance i think between the two in this case thank you thank you so much for that um it's 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 a difficult question um let me let me um try to raise another another issue that that um is, i think came up at some point is it still in my head um the the the, the problem with current um well, I, I guess I could say high impact journals is, of course, that publication costs. There are costs related to 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 publication. Um, I, I edit a the Jamaica Journal of Science and Technology. Um, it is it is not a a profit for profit um, journal. In fact, it's you, you could almost characterize it as being a for loss um, journal. I mean, we know we know that it's going to continue to cost us, but it's it's a public good. Um, so so we we expend the 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 capital on it. Um, but the whole business of how you finance the 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 publication of materials and and all the process that goes with it. The, the vetting, the the, um, the quality assurance, the and and, and all these things, um, somebody has to pay. And um, the question is, how do we arrange that? Uh, it, it was raised that um, university libraries and um, could take up the 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 issue of. Um, of not only being repositories, but being publishing houses. I mean, of course, we see that done in places like Harvard Press, Cambridge University Press, um, which which do that kind of thing. But uh, I think those are very much for profit organizations as 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 we speak. Um, now, uh, how we organize that in a in a in the face of universities that are receiving less and less um, support from the public purse and which are being asked to be more and more entrepreneurial is 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 a, a, a difficult question the difficult question and um although uh, the idea is an appealing one and, and i think it was colin who who found that a, a very attractive idea uh, so, so I would, I would want to, to possibly fall upon him and ask him to see if he could flesh out for us how he would see that working in terms of uh, the models that we have in the region for, for university libraries becoming publishing houses. Okay, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, if you if you if you consider I don't know if this will make any sense, but I will say if one considers um, the concept of open software, um, here here is a case where you put the software out in in the open, 
so that everyone can modify and benefit. But the services that you build around it belong to you. And that way you profit. In other words, you know, so the library may have to operate in a similar way. It may have to um, offer services beyond just publishing in, or, in order to make in order to make money. So in other words, you this may I don't know if this will make any sense, but I I would suggest if you go along that road, perhaps you put the publications out there at no cost, but if you want to access um, certain types of services that go around, and I remember I'm not a librarian, so I'm not entirely sure, go around um, the existence of those journals, then you pay a cost. So if I want to um, have a copy, then I would pay some money to get a copy and, and things like that. So maybe along the lines, because at the end of the day, I can't see how we could avoid having to pay something. You know, we, we, we can't really avoid costs. Even if the, the journal article, the journals are, are put there for free, you still need to pay someone to uh, manage the server or to, to put the books on the shelves or, or whatever it is. You, you can't avoid costs. I think the, the issue really is um, what is reasonable cost versus being uh, exploiting. Um, so, I, so even if you look at apps, for example, mobile apps, you put the app out there for free. But if you want the services that come behind it, the extra services, then you have to be willing to pay and, and so on and so on. But you still get some of the benefits from having it um, existing on your mobile device. So perhaps that is the sort of model that one has to look at. But I, I would definitely say I can't see, as a dean, I have never been able to, to figure out a way to avoid costs entirely because something has to be paid for. And I don't know if that suggestion makes sense, but that's one of the suggestions that I have come up with. <clears throat> I don't know if that helps. Right, thanks, thanks for that, Colin. Um, the, the, that, that is the rub, isn't it? Somebody has to pay, um, you know, not only for managing the, 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 the service, but, but for the production of, of, of these things. I mean, this has always been so. I mean, from the, from the days of the invention of the printing press to now, it has always been a question of who pays and, um, and where does the money come from uh, to pay for it? Um, it, 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 it would usually, in the, in, the, in the very earliest days, come from some um, rich benefactor or, or some um, patriarch or king or, or something <laughs> in order to enhance their reputation who would spend the money to make the publication happen. But um, and then they, 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 of course, the big for-profit journals found that there was much to be gained in it. In fact, it's a, it's such a such a remarkable paradigm that they have they have evolved, where people do the work at often at public expense. Um, they they write up the work at uh, and 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 submit the work for for um, publishing. They, 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 the publishers then um, get persons to, to review and, and do the quality assurance free of cost. And then they make the profits um, off it all and, uh, and, and gain copyright to the whole kit and caboodle. It's, um, it's, it's, it's the most remarkable model that I can think of, but it seems to have obviously worked wonderfully for, for the big publishing houses. And, um, and it, it, it really is past time that we uh, seek to, to get around this somehow and to find some other ways of organizing these things. Um, Liet, is that you, um, Bran? Bran, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, um, Ron. Well, my idea, I guess, would be particularly popular. I mean, where are scientists can demonstrate the utility of their particular discipline. That might be an easy sell so that you can say, for example, that as happens in developing nations, a certain percentage of GDP is devoted to research and I guess research and publication. Uh, it's, it's perhaps a tougher sell if you're talking about blue sky research in the developing world and yet uh, there is there are arguments to be made in favor of uh, paying 
I, I guess in a form, yeah, whether you call it a tax, um, and I know um, tax is, um, it's only a three letter word, but it carries all of the weight of something more. Um, I think that there is, or there ought to be uh, an appreciation, and, and it's the scientists who will have to work to building that appreciation, that there is value in science, even if uh, you can't immediately identify uh, some 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 concrete gain that you can get from a certain pursuit. Uh, and yes, I know right after saying it, I know that there's a that that's going to raise some flags. Um, who should be paying for this? Why should we pay for it? And yet, uh, the pursuit of science carries with it some intangible benefits that we need to do a better job of communicating to all and sundry. Thanks. That, thanks very much, Brian. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I see LV up at the top here. Does that mean that you're waiting to make a comment yet? Uh, I was not, but I can. Uh, I just put in fact in the chat uh, an idea that uh, there are some journals, in fact, that are free for publishing. They are peer reviewed and uh, are run at universities. And uh, I just put one example of the Journal of Community Engagement and Scholarship, because this one is also accessible for lay language people. In fact, they ask uh, usually um, um, people from the community to also as well as students to write their own perspective and blogs and different things like that. So uh, so there's a way to to make it. And in fact, this is the thing. It's it's all depends on how complicated the, the big thing with uh, the. Um, the large publisher. Uh, uh, Leah, and Leah, please, please produce, um, pardon my really bad manners here. Um, it's fascinating. Could you help us? Um, uh, understand the funding for this particular um, example that you've given us. Yeah, in fact, uh, in this case, it's run vol with volunteers, an editorial board that is all volunteers. And uh, I should say we're preparing a special issue uh, uh, for this journal right now. Um, and what is interesting is that the uh, university there uh, is, uh, I believe the University of Arizona is um, supporting it through pretty much the platform of uh, the library. And uh, so all the rest is done through volunteers. So there's somebody who um, uh, is the editor, but you have also people who are doing more the technical component. Um, and, and it's interesting because it has worked quite well. Uh, and it seems in a way that they started in 2008, so it's already 12 years old and uh, it's it's been uh, a good way to um, to ensure that these publications are, are accessible. Again, without cost for people uh, to publish into it, but also to receive papers. So this is uh, quite amazing. Uh, I know a few other places that have uh, done a bit the same way. Uh, and what what is necessary is, uh, as you can imagine, is to make sure that the library um, is willing, uh, but also that the um, the university is open to this. That I think these are the type of factors that are quite important. And uh, it's true that in some way the process can be a little bit slower because uh, you don't have a full army of people who can just uh, punch the paper and put it uh, to another person. But um, at least it's done. And I should say the, the peer review is double blind. So it's you don't know the reviewer, but you don't even know the authors. So it's it's really strengthening for me in a way uh, the way that it's done. And I, I, I think it's a good example. Thanks, Leah. Very, very, very good example. But here's the rub. Um, who's going to publish in it? And if you publish in it, how does that affect your curriculum vitae? And how does that affect you when you go up for promotion? And you have 
your publications in this journal rather than in one of the high impact journals? Probably because I'm already full professor, I don't worry too much anymore <laughs> about promotion, so that's a bit easier. But uh, I should say that this is where we, we really need to start rethinking how we promote these type of journal and how we, you know, one thing that uh, a colleague said to me at one point, if you publish a paper and then you make it as a small article, either for Twitter, for Facebook or for uh, Lincoln or even for like here we have uh, what we call the conversation. It's amazing, but usually your paper is read five times more than if you just publish period, even if it's in nature or nature communication or something like that. I have some there and, and they are not more read necessarily than some of the, the papers. And I remember the best example for me is one that uh, a chapter that uh, that we uh, that I wrote with a colleague that was uh, published in a uh, sustainable dialogue with another UNESCO chair in Canada. And this is uh, on the web period publication, uh, basic peer review in this case. Not a lot of, uh, you know, publicity, but still just probably enough that this paper was picked up by a professional uh, in Florida uh, who contacted me to ha go to St. Bartholomew with uh, her as a person to help on sustainable development for the island. This paper got picked up gradually by Harvard University in the leadership professional leadership program as a discussion paper. So the impact of this paper, even if it was not in the nature or anything like that, still has a huge impact. So I think we have to, to really rethink about that. And I like uh, some like Cambridge University in UK, for example, when you ask for tenure and promotion, now you have a new category. And I should say that I just reviewed uh, for another university in Canada that is doing the same. You have your publication, you have what you have done in teaching, you have done in services, but you have to demonstrate all what you did, what is the impact on the community? So it goes back to uh, what uh, Brian, I believe, said. Uh, it's the impact of not the the factors of the journal, but the impact of the work. And that's something that I know it's difficult. Uh, here in Canada, we're trying to change the model. Uh, we are signatory of uh, the DORA declaration. Uh, and but it's still, you know, we have to push and we have to make sure that the next generation of students are getting this message as well. I think this is of great importance. If if we if we cannot get our institutions to change the way in which uh, the young academics move up through the system, then we are going to be faced with this problem for a very long time. So so clearly is one of the important pressure points that that attention has to be paid to. Colin. Colin. Yes, uh, I just wanted to fully support what we just said. Um, it is one of the most um, disheartening thing as a dean that I have to do is when I know that a particular staff member's work has impacted heavily, but it hasn't gotten all the citations, you, you then fight this battle to convince persons that this is worthy of whatever it is that, go, that goes ahead. And, and I, I want to support that. If we, if, if we don't change, if we don't, if we, I'm trying to catch my breath. If, if, if we don't change and go down this route of removing impact factors and so on, we in the region are going to suffer, continue to suffer under it. And, and, we, and our journals, our local journals as well, our regional journals will suffer as well, even though those journals cons consist of quality work and so I just wanted to not add anything more just fully support that that belief and I think the example given was was a good one where it was picked up the paper was picked up elsewhere and it and demonstrates the impact that it made and so I agree for our younger academics and so on coming up 
Otherwise, it's going to get progressively worse. So I just want the support. Thanks, Colin. I think I saw um, Brian's hand up too. Oh uh, no, no, Ron. That was earlier. I, I just took it down. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, Colin said what you were going to say. <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah. It, it 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 is it is such a very important thing. Um, you know you know what I'd like to do now. Um, I, I would like to ask Liet since you introduced the 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 open declaration Liet. Um, are there any other issues um, that that you think that we um, we need to focus on that we haven't focused on as yet? It's already been a very inclusive discussion, which I really enjoy. I should say, uh, I, I I think the main thing also is probably how to make sure, um, yeah, changing the mentality, um, how to make sure that. Uh, even universities understand better uh, how to communicate with um, with the media, the government, the industry, because the industry, and this is something that has been avoided in the recommendation. And I, I think it's in big part because of uh, the challenge and uh, and all the, the issues are related to IP and all that. Um, and that's that's the. I think something that will take a lot more time. If at least we can start, um, you know, really considering work, considering uh, how to better get everybody at the same level, uh, that will already be a big step. Um, transparency, uh, the sharing, the knowledge, uh, respecting uh, indigenous traditional knowledge, all these things that will be already be a big step. Uh, it will have to be by increment, and I have the feeling that talking, you know, at one point I was talking to another uh, VP, and um, he, we were discussing about the the life of uh, these, all these big publishing companies and all that that are for profit, and uh, with the new creation now of uh, these uh, different. Um, uh, journals that are free, open access and all that, there will be a point that this journal will not be able to survive anymore. Uh, you know, you cannot continue to pay six thousand uh, dollars to put an article in nature. It's not affordable even for for us in Canada. We don't have the grants for that. So this is the thing is at, at one point the system will break. And that, and this is where I think everybody has a role to play in that, in, uh, in terms of the perception, in terms of uh, changing the mentality. Uh, it will probably take more than one generation of researchers just because, you know, it's difficult to remove, you know, it's a bit uh, trying to change the mentality of those that have been trained by the previous one. So uh, that's something that, uh, but the discussion is coming and, and I think we have to maintain that discussion. I think that's the important part. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I look forward to seeing uh, a real change in, in, in certainly that, that kind of paradigm that, that has such a strong hold on the careers of scientists. Um, and um, a change needs to come. Uh, and, and, and we have to make sure that when that change comes, that, that that's a change for the, for the better and, and, and that we're not just shifting one in-group to another in-group, um, as, as, someone, as someone said. I saw Brian's hand up, uh, still there, good. Brian? Yes, um, thank, thank you, Ron. So I was, I was sort of uh, responding to Amanda, um, making the point that science communication ought not just to focus on the written word and journals, but also needs a presence on social media um, and not just, well, not just television. Even, even to say Facebook is to already date um, oneself because I understand that Facebook is for um, the, the older generation. 
so so now we're talking Twitter and Instagram, Instagram. Um, and, and being used as as platforms to communicate science. Some of that I was making the point to Amanda in the chat that some of that has received quite a boost from the pandemic uh, where social media has come to the fore as a, as a mechanism for communicating all manner of things. Some of our staff members here have been having um, sometimes twice a month uh, having sessions with local libraries where they discuss some aspect of the natural world or um, aspects of astronomy. And more are planned. We actually have some plan coming out of the faculty uh, that should have already seen the light of day, but conditions being what they are, um, they, but they're on the way, they're coming. So, yeah. like I said, it's it's the site, guys. The the whole the whole notion of open science and communicating more. The yeah. the the major challenge, as I see it, continues to be building a robust framework to make sure that this um, is not just going to be personality driven. One and two that it's it's robust enough to survive funding challenges. Um, uh, personalities um, and that it's it's going to happen uh, on an ongoing basis, on a regular basis uh, and really stimulate um, uh, people joining in. Everyone, everyone serving, doing, making our contribution. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. You have made, you have made this point several times that that's you would wish to see a number of changes made, but you would wish to see these changes made in a sustainable fashion, um, supported by very robust um, structural elements that are not based upon the efforts of one individual, um, but, but which have continuity over time. Um, you are clearly advocating for policy changes, policy changes that would be embedded in the behavior of our systems from uh, the, the the governmental um, levels and um, and clearly this is this is one of the things that that we ought to be aiming for and and so you know I think attention to our science policy and um, and and not just to have a science policy written down as Colin said but to have one that 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 is actually honored in the observance um, and, and and followed. The, the, the whole business of community science and, and how we engage the community in the scientific process is, a, is an important one to my mind. Um, how we set about doing it, what our primary goals should be, and how we execute those goals, I think need to be defined very clearly. And perhaps at some time, not too far in the future, we, we need to have a forum where we sit together in one way or another and try to work out exactly how we achieve these things um, and, and what our aims ought to be. You know, you know what comes to mind is, what is, is, is in, in going through the papers for this thing. One of the things I came across was in fact that there was someone somewhere using the steel pan as a um as a method of um involving community in science doing community science in investigating the vibration patterns on the surface of the of, of the steel pan and 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 I, and I wondered whether um your your namesake Brian Copeland was in any way involved with this although I did not see any mention of him or of the university um of the West Indies at St. Augustine, uh, although, although um, he as Dean of the Faculty of, of Engineering um, was certainly involved in the development of the electronic steel pan and um, certainly involved in the, in the, in the work that, that had to do with trying to define um, the, the um, sound patterns in pan. Uh, I don't know if you know anything further about this, but I saw, um, I saw Mr. Hannams um, Everton. Hello, I saw your hand up, Everton. 
Mr. Hannum. No? Um, yes, Brian. Um, I was going to advise you that you have me at a disadvantage, Ron. Um, um, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that, that particular um, study that you mentioned. Okay. I, I, is this, Nathan, um, Nathan, are you trying to break in? I, I see a little caption popping up with your name. Um, no, just mentioning that we are now officially uh, closing to the end of the, uh, to the webinar. Okay, well, I just want to thank everybody for their robust participation and, um, and for the discussions. I, my only feeling is that there are so many areas that, that, that one may want to, to discuss and which I would really perhaps have liked to, to have seen. But um, uh, I think that, that we have covered some ground, we have heard some opinions, and um, we will try and put this together and uh, see what, what um, comes out of it. I, 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 I certainly believe that we will need to continue our discussions and to um, and have follow-up meetings, um, perhaps to deal with more specific items and more specific suggestions um, in a more focused fashion and to map out some of the routes through which we might be able to convert some of these um, ideas, thoughts um, into, into action, which has the possibility of making a difference. So thank you all very much for your involvement and your time. Um, um, before you sign off, Ron and Nathan, both Solange and Everton are making a very important point, which kind of goes back to what I was saying. Um, structures, mechanisms, um, to forge these links and communication. I, I, I was asking Everton if he wanted to, to make some comments, but I don't know if he heard me. Is he, is he there? Well, he's, he's put a question in the chat. I'm actually not seeing the chat. Right, so he's asking. He, I, I don't know if he's having problems with his mic, so I'm going to read it for him. He says he's trying to comment that after these discussions, how do we impact the work of UNESCO in science? Which is a bit similar to what Solange was saying. She wants to know what is the best way to contribute ideas or be part of further conversations. Right, well, um, well as I was saying, I, I think we're going to have to try to organize a number of um, separate uh, forums in which we um, can have more focused discussions on some of these items and more in-depth um, discussions, uh, which will lead to some form of action. And um, the, the, the way in which we, we would involve those persons who, who wish to be involved would be to collect their indications of interest and put them on a list that if, if, if and when such discussions um, take place that they would be invited. Uh, I'm, I'm not hearing any responses, but um, and I hope that it, is it just that we've come to the end of been cut? I think we're at one o'clock, so, so perhaps that's our cutoff. Hello, anybody there? We're still here. Oh, Nathan, that too. So, again, I thank you all for your involvement, and um, and we will have to to produce a summary of the of of this discussion, and. Um, and uh, we will see where we take it from there. Thank you again.